Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining in. I'm very excited to be um, presenting this webinar, especially in our um, Pride Month. So I'm excited about that. Uh, as, um, they, as they said before, my name is Dr. Miguel Vasquez Rivera. I am a gay cisgender psychologist, and I use the pronouns he and him. So we're going to head out and start with, uh, with our webinar. So thank you for joining. And please be sure to make questions um, that we will address at the end of the webinar. Next. Cindy, can you put next? Thank you. So we're going to have the objectives first. We're going to talk about um, basic concepts. Um, we're going to start with that. It is really important to understand the, the acronym, but most of all, three basic concepts that describe the acronym of the LGBT community. Um, in sec as a second objective, we're gonna talk about identity development and how the experience around that evolves for transgender identities. And the third objective would be the healthcare, healthcare barriers and ethical interventions that we as um, mental health professionals are going to have um, towards the um, gender non-conforming and transgender community. Next. So this next slide is the basic concepts that are even more important than the LGBT acronym. Uh, we're gonna talk about sex, gender, and sexual orientation. If we leave with some knowledge out of this webinar- um, Yeah, we cannot think... hear you. I'm sorry. Oh. Hello, hello? You're not muted. I'm going to mute you and unmute you for a second. Let's see if that works. Hello? Hola? No, we lost audio. I don't know why. Does anybody else like? Yeah, a lot of people are saying they can't hear. Oh, yeah, they hear you. Okay. So maybe it's on my end. Hello? Hello? Can you still hear me? Hello, hello. Cindy, let me know if they hear me or at Maddie. Hello, hello. Hola. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, it was on my end. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. It's good that you let me know. Okay, so uh, we were talking about the three basic concepts. Let's go back uh, to that one about the three basic concepts, which are sex, gender, and sexual orientation. Okay. So if we leave with something out of this webinar, and this is a, for me the most important part because it's the way we can enter and understand our community. Well, sex is the first one. Sex is a biological term and it classifies men, women or intersex, right, uh, persons. And we figure out sex at birth or even in the sonogram, right, when we can see the presence or absence of a, of a penis. Sex, um, is, a, is a category that is described by internal and external genitals, sex hormones, and sex chromosomes. So that's very important because sex is biological and only biological. But a concept that piggy banks out of sex is the gender. They're separate, but they are sometimes um, related. Gender is when we find that um, the sex of, of the baby, right? The gender is what comes after that. We as a society, which is a very social and cultural concept, we as a society assign different genders depending on the genitals that we see in the baby. So if we see a vagina, for example, we're gonna associate and we're gonna develop uh, feminine uh, attributes. We are going to assign feminine roles and like that in the other way, when, with the masculinity, right? Gender is a social construct. So we can see like it's a spectrum. We can find gender from being very feminine towards very masculine and everything in between. Okay, so that's very important to understand that gender is not just masculine and feminine. There's a lot of other um, gender constructs and roles that we have to uh, uh, see, right? So gender divides into gender divides in expression, and identity. Identity is, is what, how we conceive ourselves, right? So it's in our brains. Expression is how we present to the world. So those are two concepts that are very important for us as mental health professionals to 
explore within our clients or patients. And then we have sexual orientation, which has nothing to do with gender and sex. It has to do with an arrow that goes from us to other bodies or other persons. And depending on who the other person is, is that we describe our sexual orientation. So it's a physical, romantic, emotional, and spiritual um, attraction toward the same gender, sex, or other, right? Um, and it's usually called bisexuality, heterosexuality, and homosexuality. And for most people, it's something that is um, rigid and which doesn't, doesn't change, but for some, it is continuous and fluid. Next. So if you can see this illustrated concept, which I love and I use a lot in my uh, private office, um, and I suggest you do the same. It is not for clinical purposes, um, but it still gives us so much information when we are exploring these areas with our clients. Um, there you see in the, in the top two, you see the gender, then you see the sex, and then you see the sexual attraction. You as a person, right, as a participant or client, you should mark every single line that you see there. From the zero to the complete arrow, you can see how the, it expresses it in one person. Um, so this um, illustration changes, um, divides a sexual attraction or sexual orientation into sexual attraction and romantic attraction, which changes from people, from person to person. So it's very important. And one of the things we're going to see a lot with our gender non-conforming or transgender uh, clients is that the gender identity and the gender expression doesn't necessarily co correlate. And that's something important. That's something that we wanna ask ourselves. Why is it not the same? Why is this person feeling some way inside but not, not being able to express it to other people? So that's um, one of the key things that I look for in this um, concept, in this illustration when I do it with my clients. So next. So now we, we can see the acronym, right? The acronym divides the three main concepts, sex, um, gender, and sexual orientation in this few couple of letters, and there's more. So I usually do, and there's a, a, a controversy around how many letters should you use. And it's very important to use as many as you want and you like. Me, myself, my personal decision is to do LGBT plus. And it has a very simple uh, answer most people understand and know our community by the LGBT acronym only, the four letters, right? So you put a plus to be mindful that there are other categories that need to be there too. Okay, so the main ones are lesbians, who are women who are physically, romantically, and emotionally attracted to other women, um, gays, which are men who are attracted to other men, bisexuals are persons that are, are attracted to more than one gender, transgender, are persons who are, um, whose gender identity or expression is different than the one they were assigned at birth, right? So when we think about sex assigned at birth, that is one of the things we assign at birth, but also when we know for sure that the baby is, let's say male or female, we then and there assign the gender as well. So when we're painting the room of the baby and we're painting it blue because it's a male, that's we are assigning gender to. When we're buying dolls for girls, we are assigning um, gender roles as well. So gender is assigned at uh, uh, birth too. So transgender are people that are not um, comfortable with that identity that they um, assign at birth, okay? And then question, and we're gonna be talking about much more about the transgender community in this webinar in particular. So when we were talking about questioning, which is the cue that usually people put at the end, um, questioning is reserved mostly for adolescents, but not necessarily. Those are people that are questioning their sexual orientation or their gender um, identity, right? So are people that are not categorized, they don't feel that they, they should have a label or they label themselves, but um, they're part of the community because they are questioning that. So we're gonna see a lot of questioning people when we when we have our private offices or our clinics and we're servicing, and in, especially in the mental health profession. Um, next. 
So opening up and talking more about the transgender community, we can see here the transgender umbrella. It is uh, an illustration that I love and I use a lot too um, because it's, it's done by the community. And as you can see, there's a lot of different categories about being transgender. And, and that's, uh, that's great and that's possible because transgender uh, works towards gender, right? And gender is a social construct. So there can be as many genders are there as there are people because they're constructed, right? So we're gonna talk about a, a few of those. We're not gonna spend a whole time on those, but there are different categories. And the most important thing for us is to, when the, someone tells you, I am a cross-dresser or are, I am gender non-binary or gender variant or gender queer, is that we ask the person, okay, so what is this and how do you describe this on yourself, right? Can you define that for me? Uh, how's it, wh what's your experience being genderqueer? So that's the way we corroborate if our definition of the term is the same as the clients. So I wanna I point out a couple, right? Like for example, drag queens and drag kings are people because of, first of all, categories here depend on how much and for what reason the person expresses their, their gender. So for example, drag kings and drag queens are people that express their gender, their difference in gender, and by entertaining people, right? Um, we have, for example, bi-genders. Bi-genders are people that combine both genders, masculine and feminine, in one presentation. Agender. Agender are people that believe that they don't have any gender upon themselves, right? Androgynous persons, for example, are persons that combine it's sort of as by gender, but not as clear in the presentation of genders. For example, if you think about androgynous persons, you can and go back to the to pop culture. We have Boy George, for example, and Ali Nan uh, Annie Lennox. Um, so, sorry about the other uh, persons that are here of other generations. I am uh, 80s kid, so those are my examples. So, and one uh, of the categories that I definitely wanna point out is the transsexual category. Transsexuals are persons that are not um, comfortable with the assignation of gender at birth, but neither as the assigned sex at birth too. Transsexual people will not feel comfortable with their bodies and with the sex assigned. So um, they're gonna probably be uncomfortable with primary and secondary gender characteristics and may and may not or may not do something about it. Okay, so when we, we talk about um, when we talk about um, hormone treatments, when we talk about hormone blockers, when we talk about surgeries, we're mainly talking about the transsexual community. Next. So why is this all important and why are these webinars and, and education opportunities so important? It's because we live in a heterosexist and sexist world. And what does, what does that mean is that we um, live in a hostile world for the LGBT plus community. And when we are being heterosexist, we're being and assuming that everyone is heterosexual. And how do we go about it when we are in a clinic setting? when we uh, are doing our initial intake and we're asking the person that we have in front of us that we perceive as masculine, we're asking if he has a wife, right? Then and there you're telling the person, I think you are heterosexual. And by that, only that question, the person can feel uncomfortable and will stop probably um, addressing other questions uh, or answering other questions that are along those lines of sexuality and we're going to miss a lot of important information that we need for prevention or education purposes. On the other hand, we have cis sexist attitude. This is an attitude that assumes that everyone in the room or everyone that we're talking to is uh, cisgender. Cisgender is the opposite of transgender. Cisgender is non-transgender. So if we see something, we, uh, someone, and we think he, uh, this person is feminine, um, we rapidly think it's a woman, right? And we call her out as using pronouns as her or saying miss. And those are assuming that she is cisgender. And that way we um, 
we, we don't visualize the transgender community or the possibility that a person can be uh, a, a, pers a transgender person that cannot, that hasn't transitioned. Next. So all of this takes us to, to the most important model that we have right now and has incredible um, research sustainability. Uh, it's the minority stress model. This model not only talks about LGBT plus community, it talks about race minorities, ethnic minorities. Um, they talk about a whole different spectrum that we're gonna see in the next slide. But it, it, what's, what it says is that a person just by being part of a minority group exposes, um, are being exposed to chronic stress, right? And there's an issue about oppression and the minorities that, that we have uh, in ourselves, right? So they're more exposed to prejudice, to violence, to discrimination or the expectation of discrimination uh, and may or may not suppress their gender identity or sexual orientation. Next. So this is a slide that I constructed specifically to, specifically to show the minorities that we have in the United States, in the continental US, the United States or the Puerto Rico, um, which talk about what are categories that are minorities and that can be exposed to minority stress. And it's very important to be mindful about how this can change depending on the culture. And some of the categories can be misplaced and some would be mass uh, majority and some minority. So, but the important thing to do here is to analyze um, in ourselves or in our clients, what minority categories do we belong to? Um, it's not the same to be gay, black, um, from the Dominican Republic living in Iowa than being gay, white, American living in New York City. So that's one of the things that we need to always explore because they're gonna have probably different experiences. If we have one, two, three, four, or five categories of minority in ourselves, we're gonna be so much more exposed to um, to the uh, to minority stress. So I want to do a shout out to, to the Black Lives Matter movement because definitely our LGBT plus community that belongs to the black community as well are being double um, uh, double uh, two times as affected as anyone else. Next. So I want to I want to uh, talk a little bit about the identity and coming out process, which are two different things that happen in a continuum. And we can see research that shows um, how they develop in in our lives, right? So we have uh, the different stages: childhood, puberty, and adolescence. And we can see how gender identity in this research in particular develops between the ages of one and a half and three years old. But it's not until four years that parents can differentiate the gender behavior of their children. And at six, the minor can be conscious about and mindful about it. So that's very important because it becomes a reality when you're faced with other, with socialization basically, because at four years old, or six years old, the, the child is beginning to, uh, to, to start at school. So then they're seeing the socialization of the lines, the boys line and the girls line, the, the play, uh, the playroom and the different toys that they can use. So it's a differentiation, but a very important differentiation in terms of gender. Uh, so we want to be mindful and explore that a lot with our gender non-conforming and um, gender expansive and transgender communities that we're going to see. And throughout the life, the, from childhood to adolescence, um, children or, or persons recognize or start to recognize their attraction. And another uh, study says it, it, you begin the sexual orientation development at eight years old. That's the mean age. And then um, the coming out is later on in, in late adolescence. So it's important to understand that uh, gender identity as well as, as well as sexual orientation, they come out later than it actually occurs. 
So it's important to be when we're addressing transgender communities and, and LGBT plus communities in, in general, we wanna, we wanna always um, be affirmative of their gender and their sexual orientation since childhood. Because a lot of other studies actually say when, when you, we talk about with adults that they, they say, as long as I can remember, I am this way. So it's a very common sense that people, they develop from since childhood. Next. So um, anyone that is starting to work with transgender needs to um, read with Arlene Lev. Arlene Lev, um, I'm sorry if I pronounced it uh, incorrectly, but um, it's, I think it's Lev or Leave. Um, it's the trans identity development stage. Here we can see how, how the, the identity starts to develop and the different stages that we can intervene and how to intervene. Uh, in the first is stage one, which is the conscious awakening. This can, can happen in many, many um, developmental stages, but it's usually, as we talked about earlier, um, come, it starts um, at six years old with a, with a child is conscious, but it, it come, uh, starts to develop at that age. So the second stage is the, is the information search. Um, it's important that right now, our internet is the most important place where people look for answers. And as you know, and in the internet, there's all sorts of information. So if we are a therapist and we are in that stage with that person, it's very important to pinpoint and show them in the right direction to which information, scientific information to um, research. But obviously they're gonna see the trans umbrella, they're gonna see all the different ca categories and it's important to discuss this with them. Um, stage three is a coming out to significant persons. Um, research, research shows that significant persons, especially in adolescents, are not family members, especially in the LGBT plus community when they're starting to um, uh, discuss their um, the diversity. Um, mostly are friends. And depending on who their friends are, that could be a positive or a negative thing. So that's why in the family um, system, we want to keep a very open mind and open attitude towards uh, the LGBT plus community, because you might sometimes not know or not recognize that you have a LGBT plus member in the in the family. So we want to keep it light, affirmative there, so that you can be considered as one of the persons to actually um, come out to. So stage four is exploration or self-imposed of self-imposed categories. As I said, they're going to look for categories that their definitions and see which one fits the best, which ones do I identify most with, and that's what are they going to talk about. So stage five is exploration, transition issues, and possible body changes. Not all the persons that are of trans identity are going to pass through this stage, and this is very important, right? For some people. Um, transition means um, letting their hair grow. For some people, transitions are um, changing clothes. Um, and for some other people are intervening with their bodies uh, through hormones or through surgery. And lastly is the integration, which is the acceptance and post-transition issues. Of course, family is very important, especially in our Latinx communities where there's a lot of familismo, which is um, the integration of the family in every step of the way of their lives. So it's, it's very important to be uh, mindful of how things are going to go about after transition. So uh, um, questions such as, what are we gonna do with childhood pictures? Are we gonna keep them up? Are we not gonna keep them up? How are we going to uh, talk about when you were a child? Are we gonna say when you were a boy? Or are we gonna say before you transitioned? Or are we just gonna say when you were a little girl, right, in terms of the transgender women? So it's important and mindful to every step of the way, us as psychologists or mental health professionals, being uh, a guide for them to better transition or transition um, in a better way. Next. So this is a very important um, question. Is every children that plays or that explores their gender transgender? 
And the answer is no. Uh, we have gender expansive children. Gender is a construct. So there's going to be a lot of children that are going to explore um, beyond traditional lines, their gender. And they're gonna have behaviors, uh, preferences or other traits that are not gender typical. You're gonna see boys that are playing with dolls. You're gonna see girls that are playing with um, cars. As, as you can see, cultures are changing. So what is a truck? Is a truck really for only boys? Is a doll really for only girls? Or is that something that we invented, that we defined? So that's something to be very, very, um, to explore in our, fam in our families and the families that we're treating, what are the gender roles and the gender definitions there? Um, but in these children, when we um, guide them to other toys or when they get exposed to other persons that actually tell them that they cannot do that, they don't get distressed when asked to do other things. So that's very important. And one of the questions, of, by the way, of the poll, um, they don't get distressed, except if they get bullied at school or stig uh, stigmatized at school. Um, so on the other hand, the transgender children, they are going to have this stress when they are um, confronted with the negativity uh, of that sort of conduct or, or behavior. If you say, no, you can have that doll, or no, you can have that truck, or other type of examples, they get the stress because that's something that talks to their identity, not to something they are exploring towards to. So it's important to have the change. And especially transgender children are going to be, when they're um, able to talk, they are, some of them are going to be able to say, I am a boy or I am a girl, right? So that's important to differentiate from gender expansive children. Gender expansive children are children that are exploring but are not identifying us. Next. And it's very common, by the way, um, for families, I get this uh, consult, consultations a lot. Um, families that are coming and saying, oh my God, my, my child is transgender. Uh, I saw him uh, playing with the dress. That is very important uh, orientation um, that quickly resolves the problem is orienting about, um, giving orientation, I'm sorry, about gender expensive children. Most of them are not transgender children, okay? So um, the coming out, um, I put this slide in because coming out is such a significant moment in their lives. Um, people of the heterosexual or cisgender community do not come out. So it, it is especially important for the LGBT plus community. And coming out is a big deal. It's an exposure, a probable exposure to rejection and discrimination. So it's a very distressing moment or event or series of events because it's not uh, just a moment. Uh, we come out when we tell our friends, we come out when we tell our families, we come out if we change jobs, if we change schools. So it's a series of events, right? But well, LGBT youth should have the right to self-determinate. They should choose how, when, where, and to whom they will come out. And it's especially important for us as, as therapists to not ask them, have you tried with the different sex? Um, have you tried to be heterosexual? Do we ask that to heterosexual clients? Have you tried to be in a homosexual relationship or homosexual conducts? We don't. So sexuality is something that develops in each and every one in a very diverse way. So it's important that we keep it that way and we open up the space, our safe space, to actually ask, um, ask them and let them enjoy their sexuality um, if it's in a safe and secure way. Next. Next. So family acceptance, as we know, when we're talking about uh, young children um, and adolescents, it's very important. So we see with gender non-conforming children, uh, they are at higher risk of sexual, physical, and psychological abuse from their caretakers. Gender non-conformity is one of the first things that are targeted with other children. Um, they see uh, a boy that's feminine or a girl that's masculine. 
that's one of the things that pops up first. And since we're in Latinx context, uh, we see a lot of machismo. So we're gonna definitely, uh, um, children are gonna definitely pinpoint the, the boy that is effeminate. So it's very important to understand that these are children that we need to protect more. Uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual children, um, we have one of uh, one third of LGB children are accepted by their parents, one third are rejected, and one third don't come out until late adolescence or early 20s. But most parents tend to accept their children. It is very important to see the statistics because coming out is their decisions. Though they are the ones that are going to have their consequences. We can assist them if they want. Uh, but it's very important to explore what's the family context around this um, topics because that's going to help us decide if, if they should or shouldn't and we can advise um to to hold it off where they're more independent or if we or if we or they can have the next step right but ultimately it's their decision uh, <clears throat> and especially with with our latinx context where we are have this familismo <clears throat> um um, my experience with um, LGBT um, plus youth is that they tend to, uh, families tend to um, keep them until they are completely independent. They can be 30 years old and still live in a home, but the rejection and the microaggressions that they receive are expanded throughout their whole years. So it's very important to explore that with our families. And the trans children, there are a few studies of acceptance um, and this study found more experience of rejection than cisgender peers, um, the study that I cite above. Um, so it's very important to see when, when we talk about transgender, it's, it's that transgender is an, at the lowest point of uh, research, usually of the abundance of research, and also that in mostly all st statistics that we're gonna see further on in the presentation, transgender are lower or higher depending on, on, on what's bad in that category. So it's a, a protection, it's a category that we need to protect even more, especially when they're receiving our services. Next. So this is the school environment. This is a, um, a study that's, that I always cite a lot because it's done in Puerto Rico, which is not a common. Um, it's done by GLISTEN, which is the Gay and Lesbian and Straight and, uh, Educators Network. It's a, it's a network that actually does a lot of research around school environment, which is amazing. You have the statistics for the US, but they're not segregated between um, the Latin communities and other communities. <clears throat> so they're more or less the same percentages that we see in this um, topics that we are going to discuss now. We can see that 96% heard negative comments of their gender expression at school. 76% heard negative comments of their gender expression from their faculty. 68% were victims of verbal harassment because of their gender expression. 57% did not feel secure because of their gender expression at school. And 37% suffered harassment and physical aggression because of their gender expression. This is very, very significant because when we see the statistics on um, school abandonment, when we see the statistics of lower economic status, when we see the statistic of sex work that we're going to see later on on the presentation, we can understand the school environment that they were in. These are the, um, those are the consequences of where, what we're seeing right now in front of us. It is difficult to study. It is almost unbearable to study. So it's important to understand the, the context that they are um, studying in and take um, higher, um, inter, uh, more important interventions that sometimes take us away from the office and takes us to our to their school to do a presentation, for example, to talk to the to the teachers, um, to talk to their counselor, and trying to uh, protect. Obviously, with the cons uh, consent uh, consent of the adults involved of the family, other uh, caretakers, or the and even the adolescent as well. Next. So let's unbox what is trans health. Um, trans health has, has a lot of, um, as I said, the statistics are not great. 
we're working very hard to um, lessen the burden of the minority stress uh, that they that they experience. But this is a couple of um, researchers um, that we have seen. 59% um, are unemployed. Trans men, as opposed to trans women, trans men are, they were sex assigned at birth female and they transitioned to um, masculine uh, presentations or identities. Um, trans men usually have more employment. This is usually because of machismo. Um, our society tolerates more uh, a woman that is more masculine than a man that is more feminine. Okay, and, it's, and I'm saying tolerate that it's not explained. Uh, women that are more masculine are not accepted necessarily, but are more tolerated. Um, and 74% of trans women are in poverty. Uh, talking about health barriers, we see more health barriers in our trans community, um, in transportation, econom uh, econom economy, or economic status, um, having a health plan, and all of that that breaks them away from receiving treatment. Um, ATOD, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs are at the highest rate when you're comparing cisgender people and heterosexual people with um, and the LGB community. So transgender are worse in those areas, usually for coping, uh, maladaptive coping mechanisms. I have a lot of a lot of minority stress. I have a lot of discrimination, and I use um, substances to alleviate or um, uh, break away from that ex uh, experience. Uh, we see a lot of sexual work, uh, especially in trans women, and this is a reality because of survival sex work. When you don't have an education, when you don't have acceptance to be um, to be hired at traditional jobs. When you are um, discriminated or casted away by society, you need to work on something to eat. So sexual work is a reality for most, but most more than a reality is a necessity. Um, and even if we have different um, attitudes towards sexual work, for this community is something of a necessity, not uh, something that they desire necessarily. Homelessness, um, there's a study that says that 20% 20, 20 cons are considered homeless. Um, one of 12 trans women are killed and one of eight black trans women are killed. This is important to know because we see an, uh, an increase in the statistics when you factor in the minority of race. So that's why the Black Lives Matter is so important, right? Um, because it definitely increases the potential of um, being discriminated. And in the HIV rates, we see a high percentage of trans women living with HIV and STDs. Um, and also mental health, we have a higher prevalence of depression, anxiety, and suicide. And if you see this panorama, you, see, you think, well, there, there might be something wrong then with transgender people. Well, what's wrong is our society, our rigid and um, non-accepting non society. And that's what we need to change. We need to shift from thinking of a problem that the person has towards the problem that the society has. Next. So we, we as a professional group are part of the problem as well. Um, we uh, pa patholo pathologize, sorry, pathologize the transgender experience. And we have, since the beginning of the DSM. So we uh, moved from transsexuality to gender identity disorders to now gender dysphoria. Uh, as you can see, we took away from the disorder part of the name. We kept the gender dysphoria right now, but then again, it's still on the um, mental health disorders manual. So we're still um, saying the same thing. Uh, we're saying it's a disorder, even though there's a lot of people and researchers that are working with the community that actually say that it's not. Next. So the World Health Organization uh, recently, uh, almost a year ago, uh, said that um, change the in the ICD-11 change the transgender um, uh, code from being in the mental disorder to being in the sexual health. And their rationale was because 
the, the gender incongruous is treated by medical interventions, not by psychology or mental health uh, interventions. And that, is, and that is so important for the gender, uh, transgender community. Um, they need a code to access treatment. They need a code for hormone replacement therapy. They need a code for surgeries. Um, so that shouldn't be taken away from them because in, in, in the, our managed care system, um, we, have, we need to have a code or a diagnosis for to receive some sort of treatment, right? So um, they, it, it's a good, in, uh, good intervention um, to have it moved because it's a more, in a more physical and medical way that it's perceived. We're still in the mental health um, world of the DSM. We still have a lot to, to work on. <clears throat> Next. So when we're talking about gender dysphoria, we're talking about a difference between one's exper experience and expressed gender and assigned gender at birth. But especially, and this is the most important part, is the distress and problems functioning that, that the person receives or experiences after that difference. So it's when you are born and you identify as something else as you were assigned, and that becomes distressing. That's gender dysphoria. And gender dysphoria, it's expressed in so many different ways, but these are the three that in my experience are the most common. And I wanted to talk to you about it. Um, in, a, in our group sessions that we have, we have support groups of men and women uh, of transgender experience. We see that there's, there's three ways that so, um, gender dysphoria can be exper experienced. So we see the social dysphoria, social gender dysphoria, which is when people come and you interact with people, do they um, call you to their pronouns, the pronouns that you actually identify as? Trans women identify usually with um, she and her. Trans men usually identify as he and him. Gender neutral, gender uh, variant, gender non-conforming, gender non-binary usually identify as they. There are other sorts of pronouns, but they is the most common. So it's very important to identify them as such um, so that they don't feel those, that social dis gender dysphoria. Also, is how they're perceived. If you call someone ma'am, which is not ma'am, that increases their chance to experience gender dysphoria. Physical. I have um, clients, for example, that can uh, are not able to bathe themselves in the genital area, for example. They don't, they don't like to look at them uh, themselves in the mirror in that, those areas because they um, increase their physical gender dysphoria. So physical is obviously related to their body. And the psychological, um, uh, sorry for the misspelling, the psychological uh, gender dysphoria, it's about a personal process of how they perceive themselves and um, in, their, in their gender. Next. So what are we searching for? We're searching for um, mental health professionals that move to a, a trans affirmative approach. Um, it is so important um, that most experts on this topic, they all coincide with um, this model. This, this is a very important approach to take into psychotherapy or evaluations or consultations that we mental health professionals do. So it's important to know it's not an, a theoretical approach. It's not a, a model of intervention um, because it doesn't have strategies. It doesn't have, it's not a CBT, for example but definitely it's um, a framework that of knowledge that allows you to understand their experience and then choose a model that goes with this approach. Um, so it, it is something that makes you understand, uh, it's, it's I'm sorry, it's a set of knowledge that makes you understand the LGBT phobias or transphobias or negative attitudes towards the trans community increases the chance of um, having or developing symptoms, psychological symptoms. So that's very important. At the beginning in the 1980s, we saw uh, transsexuality uh, at, um, as something pathological. We, we put the blame on the person, but now we're putting the blame on society. Society um, views are too strict, too rigid about gender, um, and they should flexibilize, they should change. So we are moving towards that sense. And basic, the basic um, 
basic concept of self-determination. People should be able to be happy and free in their own worlds and how they choose to express themselves. Next. So it's good to pair, the, pair this approach with evidence-based uh, models. Uh, the objective is mostly moving clients from feeling shame to feeling pride. And that's something very important, especially uh, when we're talking about this in Pride Month. And also the support services. That is very important because sometimes traditional psychology, for example, or, or other mental health professions stay at their office. And for the LGBT plus community, this office that I'm here right now is just the beginning. We need to offer them um, going to their, to their schools, giving out um, education, orientations to 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 the the people that interact with them um sometimes it's important to uh, letter writing especially for health plans that will not cover their 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 uh, the changes or the treatments that they will want to go into um evaluations of of their um, mental state to to undergo the surgeries or this um hormone treatments. So all of that is very important for us as psychologists and mental health professionals to um, do much more than it, the traditional psychologist um, do, does in their office. Next. So this is um, sort of questions that you should have in your intake interview, especially the, the, the things that they're going to see and they're gonna fill out. This is the way that we can ask about um, this topics in particular. Next. So important, in intake questions, don't assume, ask. Um, it's, it's very important that we have, I say it's like a chip that we have in our brains, uh, a gender shift that we perceive gender from people. We need to put that off because we need to ask them, what's your name? How do you prefer that I call you? What's your gender identity like? Because sometimes people do not uh, express how they feel that we talked in the gender unicorn. Um, so we wanna be mindful of people that haven't transitioned or then feel different than they express. Always, if in doubt, use neutral pronouns. And for my Spanish speaking audience, that is specifically different, uh, difficult in Spanish. In English, it's much, much better. So use you, they, person. Those are the most gender neutral. In Spanish, usted, eh, esa persona. But when we're talking about miss, ma'am, uh, sir, those are not great pronouns to use for people because we can misgender people. And misgendering is the social part of the gender dysphoria that we can activate by that. Um, surgery questions are intimate questions. Is, it, no one knows what we have um, in between our legs. And I say that very colloquially, but uh, I think it's, it's very important to understand it that way. Just when we are their professionals and we are talking about transition um, events in their lives and things that they wanna do or, or goals that they wanna achieve, that's what you can ask. Be very mindful, those are very sensitive areas. And for the name calling of the genitals, it is something that you should ask first. How do you call um, that uh, what you have between your legs? Or how do you call genitals? Uh, it's very important to um, alleviate the discomfort that they might feel. Uh, people have the right and the option to present themselves to the world as they desire. Next. So what to do to have a trans-affirming office? Give sensibility trainings to staff. And by staff, I mean, everyone, the secretary, the janitor, um, everyone that interacts, um, it could be accidentally or, or not with um, uh, customers or clients or patients. It is very important to understand um, how uh, the whole network of persons that you have there can easily help you in making a safe space for your clients. Gender neutral bathrooms, important. I'm gonna um, accelerate a little bit because we're kind of behind a schedule. Our firming EHRs, it's important that we have EHRs that actually um, uh, assess um, the way you need to assess the gender identity and expression and sexual orientation. 
protocols and HR policies, especially if they, um, you, have, you are in a big clinic. Equality and trans symbols is so important if we have a rainbow flag or a trans flag on a equality symbol around the office. Believe me, heterosexuals and cisgender people are not going to even see it, but the LGBT plus community is going to um, see it at the beginning. And that way you are right from the get go telling them this is a safe space for you. Advocate for their health. It's very important that we are advocates for them in every setting, but especially in health plans. Um, and educate yourself on trauma informed work. After the minority, minority stress model began to um, um, be in research, we started to see how trauma related um, symptoms are in the LGBT plus community because of minority stress. So it's very important to focus our, our models and the interventions that we have um, for the transgender community on trauma. Next. Avoid refraining self-disclosures about gender identity or sexual orientation. This can be uncomfortable, especially for um, psychologists as myself that were trained not to self-disclose. Is the person's uh, space not ours? That's so, so that's so true. But when we're asked about our sexual orientation or gender identity, it is more of a screening question about if this is a safe space or not. So. You can be heterosexual and cisgender and still work with the LGBT plus community, but it's very important that you take that time to tell them how do you relate to the LGBT plus community. Well, thank you for asking. I am heterosexual, but I always go to the pride um, events. I have a, a son or a daughter or a cousin that is from the LGBT plus community. I have taken trainings on this, so I'm very happy that you're here. Take that that time to show this person that you are that he he she or they are in a safe space. Denying cisex system consequences. It's important that as we talked about it that we factor that in. Outdated outdated or imposing terminology. It's very important that we um, the terminology that I gave you is a guide. But if you the person tells you that there are another category that you didn't think of or or they self-identify as something different, it's important that you let that self-identification be the one that it's used. Affirming childhood identities, as I said before, um, acknowledging that they developed since childhood is important and having a neutral stand, that should be avoided. Um, it is important that trans-affirmative therapists are trans-affirmative. We need to affirm that we need to be uh, um, advocating for the transgender and non-conforming and non-binary community. Next. So for personal growth, we need to do self-evaluations. It is very important that we evaluate our attitudes toward this population. We all have prejudice. It's part of our human nature, but it's important that we have them in check to work with this LGBT plus community. Trainings and be very mindful of clinical guidelines. There are clinical guidelines of APA and other organizations, so it's very important to be aware of them. And SAMHSA, by the way. Next. It's important not to just um, be uh, or fight for equality or equity. It's about liberation. It's about taking away the health the barriers that prevent people from accessing things that they need. Next. This is something very important and this is why we have to keep in track on, on track on these topics. It's a very difficult paradigm. It's a, uh, it has been a paradigm shift from cultural sensibility versus cultural humility. It is important that we recognize that um, since, uh, one training is not going to make you an expert. Um, the experts are the person from the community. So we need to keep on um, training to um, be humble about and be willing to learn from our clients and from experts. But it's a continuous, um, uh, it's a continuous path. Next. So I want to uh, uh, end with a Little Prince quote which says, it is much more difficult to judge oneself than to judge others. If you succeed in judging yourself rightly, then you're indeed a man of true wisdom. And this is, uh, for me, is an important quote because first of all, we need to explore. 
we need to um, screen ourselves first. And us as a therapist, we put the well, well the emphasis on the client, but uh, before that, we need to do work on ourselves. So it's very important that we, if we want to work with the LGBT plus community, that we actually research on ourselves, our attitudes, our judgment, our our prejudice. Um, if we have discriminated or not, do we do microaggressions or not? So that we are mindful when working with the LGBT plus community. Next. So these are my contacts. If anyone wants um, questions, comments, um, I love some feedback and some questions and some curiosity. So these are the ways that you can uh, keep in touch with me. Um, I am so happy that everyone stayed until the end and that um, you gave me a chance to um, explain our beautiful LGBT plus community and all the diversity that there is. There is so much more, so please, um, uh, be mindful that this should not be the end of your um, exploration of this topic. And, and also, um, thank you again. Next. Thank you, thank you Dr. Miguel. Um, we have a lot of questions and also great feedback. So um, I'm really glad to see um, everyone saying um, that it was such a great presentation and all. So I'm going to go ahead and try to answer um, a couple of questions before we leave. I know we're a little past time, so um, we're going to try and be mindful with that. Okay, so the first question says, would a gender be the same as non-gender binary? Yes, a, well, a gender usually, if you see the, the gender spectrum from masculine to feminine, a gender would be not on the, on the gender. Um, a gender non-binary would mean that the gender, uh, the person does not consider themselves either masculine nor feminine. There should be somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. So that's the difference. It's sort of the same, but different as um, uh, as, ident as an identity. Um, okay, and I think you talk a little bit about this question uh, throughout the presentation. It says, why is gender dysphoria still in the DSM? It's almost like being transgender is considered an illness. Um, totally agree. Um, I am very against it being in the DSM-5. I think it was a progression from where it was before, from the DSM-4TR, but it's not good enough yet. Um, I think um, the DSM people, and I, I was in a couple of um, discussions about it before it launched the DSM-5, um, and they were, they were thinking that um, a, a diagnosis was needed for treatment, especially in the for guidance of their transitions for psychologists or mental health professionals. So, so it was it came from a good uh, standpoint, but then again, um, not quite. We're not there yet. Thank you. Um, the next one says, do you have any tips for educating older? Latino population with this information, especially parents of children that are LGBT plus? Um, a couple. Um, as I said, GLSEN is a very important um, source of information. Um, it's G-L-S-E-N. Um, another very important one is PFLAG, P-F-L-A-G.org. They have um, they have a resource that I, I use a lot. It's called Nuestras Familias. It's in Spanish and um, English as well. I use that usually as the first step to for, for them to, to get to know um, what's gender. Um, also, it's I found I found in the office that our our uh, family support group has been super successful. So um, putting those kind of resources to their hands, especially the ones that we get to 
well, not right in the pandemic, right? Um, but uh, if you can, and you can do still do support group, uh, that's a very important for people to link themselves with other other families that are um, going through the same process. Because let me be let me be very clear. Um, it is the main the main process is on the transgender person, but their family goes through a process as well. So we want to be mindful of them um, too. Thank you for explaining that. Um, another one says, what happens if the client is not non-binary, but they are exploring, and one of the Latino parents is having a harder time than the other? What suggestions do you have? Yeah, I've had that happen. Um, and sometimes that, that, that um, situation is part of their breaking away from therapy. That's had happened to me before. Um, because they are not meeting eye to eye on how to um, intervene with their uh, their kid. Um, we we usually refer to one of the things that has helped is referring them to couples therapy, like a family therapy without the kid, so that they can resolve how they view gender and gender transition and gender variance. Because the, not all kids transition, so that's important to to note. Um, so that that because we need to focus on where's the problem and there, and then the problem are going to be um, the families, not the, the child that is exploring their gender. Thank you. That was a great and, question, actually. Yeah, it was. Um, this one is in Spanish, but I'm gonna um, translate it just um, so that everybody knows what we're talking about. And they're asking for the difference between um, transgender and transsexual. Okay, that's a very important, all have been very good questions. Can you hear me still? Yes, very good and clear. Okay, um, those are very important questions, all of them, but this one is so um, neuralgic. Um, transgender is like the umbrella. Um, they talk, it talks about people that are diverse in gender, that they don't identify or express themselves as they were assigned at birth. So transgender is everything. So transsexual is a, a specific part of the transgender community that is they're not comfortable with the sex assigned at birth, which is not gonna be common for all the transgender folks. Okay, so transgender would be a person that is does not identify as masculine when, um, he was born with a penis or a sex assigned at birth male. Uh, a person that would be transsexual is a person that um, does not identify as masculine, but it does not identify as male body parts either. Was I clear in my uh, response? Well, I think so. I'm not sure about <laughs> this. <laughs> uh, we keep getting so many comments um, on what a great presentation you've been given. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and make two more questions just so we don't go further further on. One of them says, I think it's very important to us about pronouns identity, but how do we balance asking about that without potentially offending someone who might be more conservative or taking into account their cultural background? Yes, well, as you might imagine in Puerto Rico, um, we have a lot of con uh, conservative people around gender, especially uh, topics. So what I have done in my office that has worked a lot is we put it since in, and we put uh, those questions that I showed you in the presentation in the social demographics that we do to open up uh, an EHR. Um, so they are confronted with those uh, questions since the beginning. So what happens is that most heterosexual and cisgender people, they don't even understand what they're asked and they leave that blank. But for most of the LGBT plus community, they specifically understand what's going on and what we're asking. So they are immediately uh, putting uh, what, they're, what they have. So when, we, <clears throat> when I get the patient, I, I start to see the patient, if it's not filled out, I ask them why, and we start a conversation about gender and sexual orientation. If it's a heterosexual and cisgender person, I explain it briefly, 
and then we move on. If it's a person um, that filled out the information, I usually um, explore that in the intake interview. And then sort of in, on that same line, how do you work with a family that sees these issues from a religious perspective? Excellent question. Those, they all have been great, but this is specifically important. Um, it's not an easy task. Um, I'm gonna go right off the bat and, and say it's not an easy task, but it's not impossible. Um, usually the, the questions or the information that I give up is scientific information. So that's very important to understand the difference between one of those and to, um, to um, tell them that we are now working of, in religion. Right now we're working on science. So it's important to, to understand that this is something that happens in science, in nature. And we see it in different species of um, animals as well the differences in, in gender and the differences in sexual orientation. So this is something that happens in nature. <clears throat> then when we talk about religion um, and all, especially in the transgender community, I talk about how some of the changes that they do makes how their psychological well-being much better. And that's not only me saying, the research says it. So when we look at, at transition efforts and the consequences of it, their sexual and their physical, their I'm sorry, psychological symptoms get a lot better. So that's important to tell them what he is doing, he, she, or they are doing is important for their well being. <clears throat> so those are very strong points for parents and asking them um, what they, what, what all parents want usually is for, for their kids to be happy. So that's something, a strong point to, to talk about. And also, religion um, changes um, um, because of their leaders, because of their texts, um, their biblical texts. Um, and there are some religions that are uh, called um, uh, open door religions that are very important. And if I've seen some families change and shift, um, not their beliefs, but their religion because of their children. Um, um, uh, and they have um, gone to um, uh, open door religions that accept the LGBT plus community and they are feel more comfortable. A very important um, and uh, recommendation that I always give of a movie that I can see is, um, oh, wait, um, it slipped out of my mind. I'll, I'll be shortly uh, with the recommendation. I'll, I'll make sure to, to remember prayers for bobby it's called prayers for bobby it's about uh, a boy that is um homosexual or gay um which is another important word an accepted word a gay boy and his coming out his mother is religious i haven't found a, tra a trans related um movie about the process but this is so good and it's based on a true story Thank you, doctor. I haven't seen Have that your ready, by the way. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna end up the, the question portion for now. And I wanted to take a couple of um, minutes to say, first of all, thank you to Dr. Vasquez for such a great presentation. The feedback has been amazing. And they are asking for you to come back so <laughs> that sounds like a plan we are really happy with that and i also wanted to remind everybody because i see uh some of you asking you have the handout on the um, go to webinar panel so you can definitely download today's presentation and you have the references and everything on that handout if for any reason you cannot download it uh, please make sure to reach out you have our email on the slide that um, we are sharing right now so if you for any reason you cannot download it uh, make sure you write to us and I'll, I also wanted to ask everybody to please um, fill out our survey. You have the QR code also on the screen and the link. Just make sure that you fill those because that's what let us um, 
give everything that we do to the community and the service providers. So we really appreciate um, if you can give us that feedback and let us know what you thought of today's presentation. Once again, um, Dr. Vasquez, thank you so much for such a great presentation. And I hope that everybody has a great day. This is the end of our webinar. I don't know, Dr. Vasquez, if you want to say something before we go. Thank you for taking the chance. Thank you for being here and staying this um, this time for a long time. So um, I am very, very grateful. And I hope uh, we see each other again. Bye-bye. Thank you.